Hey, what's happening? It's the Cassius Morris Show. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm coming at you guys. It's March 21st, 2018, 7.41 p.m. It's a Wednesday. And another super busy and proactive Wednesday. I've got CJSR Radio tonight over at Comic Genius. Let me start off the show by saying happy birthday to my co-host over there, Norm Shaw. It was just his birthday yesterday, and really good guy. I appreciate the way him and the station have taken me under his wing, as I've mentioned before. And uh, I'm going to be talking with him and sending him some birthday wishes tonight. And I think it would be cool to get him on this podcast as well. He's a hypnotist and a DJ and a comedian, and he's been in the entertainment industry for about 25 years. So always good times talking with Norm. Now, this is episode 86 of the Cassius Morris Show. We're going to get into an interview with the great Seton Smith. First, I just want to let you guys know a quick message about our sponsors. The Cassius Morris Show is sponsored by Audible, and Audible is an awesome service which provides instant access to stream thousands and thousands of audiobooks on your any kind of phone, any kind of laptop, computer, tablet, whatever you have, you can stream Audible. And it's a very convenient service. What you can do is go to audibletrial.com slash TCMS. That's audibletrial.com slash TCMS for the Cassius Morris Show to download your free audiobook on the house from yours truly. That's audibletrial.com slash TCMS. Get a free audiobook of any genre. There's so many different kinds of books. Listen and enjoy a brand new service. Funny thing happened to me in the family the other day. We, uh, we actually just moved into a relatively new area. And there's lots of restaurants in the area. And one of them is a Vietnamese restaurant. Now, Edmonton is known for having awesome, awesome Vietnamese food. Uh, westernized Vietnamese food. I'm sure it's, it's probably not 100% accurate compared to what they're actually serving in Vietnam. Uh, but I think it's probably the closest, freshest, and most delicious thing you can get um, as close to that in the city. And there's lots of great places. Shout out to Doan's over uh, near White Avenue. Great, great Vietnamese spot. Um, but that's not where we went. We decided to try a brand new place, which I'm not going to name. And it's it's disappointing because we went in the place and it looks like a really nice sort of mom and pop restaurant. And it's small and it's clean and it seems like it's family run. And the food on the menu, I mean, they had a massive menu. That's one of the things I wasn't too crazy about. Um, but they had a massive menu, and the, f- the food just looked so fresh and sounded so fresh. So everybody ordered their food. The food all came. Now, everybody's food was absolutely delicious. Like, my food was some of the freshest. I, got, I just got the beef on rice. I had the nice uh, raw vegetables on the side. Delicious. My father got a, an Asian-inspired beer. It was all good. Now, my mother ordered a spicy beef dish. Now, she enjoys spicy food, as we all do, but of course everybody understands the territory where spicy becomes too spicy. It's not a a very hard line to cross, you know? It's something I remember Paul Stanley saying in reference to drugs and alcohol, but I think that the same metaphor, or analogy rather, that he used could apply here, saying, you know, it's like driving a Ferrari. You know, one second you're in control, and the next second you're wrapped around a telephone pole, Uh, aka you can lose control super quick. So that's sort of how it is with spice. You know, you can cross that limit once you put that hot sauce on there way faster than uh, than uh, you can get to the limit and way faster than you can realize it. So my mother's eating her plate and she's visibly not enjoying the food. She's visibly struggling to digest this. So everybody's saying, you know, what's wrong? She's just saying, you know, it's just really, really spicy. I know it was a spicy dish, but this is like incredibly spicy to the point where I can hardly eat it. Now, I feel like there's sort of a, an expectation at restaurants that all customers, I'd say most likely have, but not all restaurants are on the same page on this, which is when the food doesn't taste right, there's an expectation for it to be fixed. I, th- I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly simple concept. So my mother tried for the first go around with the waitress. She comes over. She says, okay, look. This sauce is super, super, super spicy. I enjoy spicy food, but this is way too spicy on another level. Is there any way that I could have this remade maybe a little less spicy? Now, the waitress proceeded to explain that that's just the way that the sauce was made. So she couldn't actually go in and change the ingredients in the pre-made base of the sauce, which is actually a super fair point. However, we're at a restaurant. We're paying customers. 
so my mother actually didn't really go back and forth with her too much because there was a bit of a language barrier. But after she left, we said, you know what? You're the customer. I don't really care what their base sauce is. You're not enjoying your food, so we think you should get another dish. That's that's the underlying point here. It's We're not going to fight you about what the base sauce is, but when my plate is inedible, we're going to have to do something about it. I don't care what the base of the sauce is. So she comes back for the second go-around. Ding, ding, round two. My mother starts telling her, okay, listen, I, I'm sorry. She says, I just can't eat this. I just can't eat this. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't make a new one. That's just what the sauce is. And, my, and then my mom, she finally pulls it out. She says, okay, that's fine. You don't have to make me a new one of this dish. But could I probably, you know, possibly exchange this for another dish? She'd only eaten a few bites. And the woman then refuses to let us change it for another dish. So I'm just kind of, you know, I'm sitting back. I'm kind of smirking. I'm like, this lady's really going to try to play this right now. She's really not going to exchange the dish after a couple bites at the restaurant when the food doesn't taste right. And she just kept fighting it. And she they didn't want to lose that $14 or, you know, probably, you know, they're probably, I feel like the place was way overcharged. It probably cost about $6 to make that plate. But they didn't want to lose whatever amount of money going down the drain. And I just and I just thought to myself, first of all, you're fighting the customer now, trying to tell them that the food tastes how it's supposed to. It's sort of like when somebody comes over to your house uh, for a couple of beers, and let's say they have two, three beers, and they're blackout drunk, vomiting, uh, and they're passed out on your couch, and you say, "Well, I thought I thought you wanted to have drinks. I thought you wanted to get drunk. You know, it's like, yeah, I wanted to get drunk, but I didn't want a blackout. You know, she wanted spicy food." She didn't want the full uh, mouth burning, I need a cup of milk, and we might as well be filming this for a YouTube channel, Spice. So, kind of frustrating. And I also thought, you know, think about the oversight of this is a family of four that have just walked into your establishment to dine. And we never know how much they like Vietnamese food. You know, I mean, we are huge fans of Vietnamese food. We probably get Vietnamese food at least once a week out. We live right next to this restaurant. I guarantee you, if they would have switched that plate, we would have brought our business to that restaurant at least once a week. Times four. You know, it's not one person. It's times four. So, you know, I feel like the oversight and the short-sightedness of not refunding or exchanging the dish really is going to hurt their business in the long run. And it got me thinking, I feel like I want to take the Cassius Morris show into restaurants as an undercover diner here in Edmonton and, you know, see how people are and maybe do a report such as this on a restaurant to let people know where they can and can't go or should and shouldn't go rather in Edmonton. I think it'd be a pretty interesting thing. So it got my mind spinning about the podcast. I'm thinking of doing all kinds of special podcasts. And by the way, my parents went for a nice steak dinner at a steak restaurant and they got their steaks. They ordered uh, their steaks well. And it was probably about eh, medium well or, or something like that. It was, it was just under. And the waitress asked them, how are your steaks? Are they completely 100% to your liking? And they said, well, they're really, really good steaks, but they aren't cooked exactly how we wanted them to be cooked. And then the waitress offered them new steaks immediately. And they said, no, we don't need new steaks. They taste good. They just weren't cooked exactly how we wanted them. But we're going to continue eating them. Thank you very much. And then the manager came over and he apologized at the end of their, their meal that the steaks weren't cooked correctly. And then he paid for their alcohol for the night, all of their drinks. That's how I expect to be treated if I'm spending my money in a restaurant. So I think restaurant owners or people in the service industry, keep that in mind. You're sending money out the door by saving that $6. You're probably losing that $4,000. This is the Cassius Morris Show. I want to get into a little bit of music here. And right after this song, we're going to jump into the interview with comedian Seton Smith. Now, this interview, before we get into the song, I have to, to go over this really quick. I stumbled upon a folder full of lost files for the Cassius Morris show. A lot of them are unusable, and a lot of them are more than usable and should have been released in the first place, but there were complications with the device that I was using at the time. Uh, I've since found it and been able to access these files, so I have a lot of podcasts that I recorded that never saw the light of day that actually deserve to. So this is one of them. Seton Smith and I sat down while I was working at a local comedy club that I no longer work at, uh, but we discuss sort of, 
you know, I'm interviewing him from the perspective of a club employee who watched him perform for the entire weekend. This was on the Sunday. And really interesting insight from Seton. He's a really, really gifted comedian. Great guy. And it's a real pleasure to have him on the podcast. And I apologize, Seton, if you do end up listening to this now that it is out for this taking, uh, I don't know, two years, two and a half years to drop. But uh, it's out. So we're going to get into the song here. This is a pick from... We're going to go with some Danny Brown here. It was just Danny Brown's birthday. He turned 37. And shout out to Danny. I don't know if I mentioned this on the last podcast, but even if I did, then he gets a double big bruiser birthday shout out over to Danny Brown in Detroit. And we're looking forward to having Danny here on the Cassius Morris show. He's a very busy man, but we have been in contact. We are doing a podcast, whether it's going to be in person when the show goes to Los Angeles or over the phone or over Skype or FaceTime at some point in the near future. That's up to Danny. At this point, I think I'm going to reach out to his management because he is an incredibly, incredibly busy guy. Um, and we're going to iron it out. So here he is with a cut off of his album, Triple X, which is one of my favorite records by him. Outstanding body of work. And this song really gets you thinking. It has such great lyrics. And, you know, the way he he sort of wove this tale is really impressive. And the beat is perfect and beautifully eerie. So here he is, Danny Brown off Triple X with Pock Blood on the Cassius Morris Show, followed by an interview with comedian Seton Smith from The Vault. And I apologize, I had a cold during this taping, so my voice sounds a little off, and I was like a little bit younger, so my nuts hadn't fully dropped. They were like a third dropped. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by Mr. Seton Smith. How are you doing, sir? Hey, man, how are you, dude? Good. Um, thanks for agreeing to do the show. I appreciate it. No problem, dude. Awesome. So this is our first meeting. We're sitting really far away from each other right now. This is weird. Yeah, yeah. we can move closer. We can move closer. Why don't you sit over here at the table? Right. You know what? We could do that. You trying to do the couches and shit? Let me move my chair over to you. Okay. Yeah, if you want to be in be... the more uh, comfortable side, you can definitely join. I got horrible posture. I don't feel like... No, <laughs> as do I. As do I. It's a big downfall when working here when you're standing. Yeah, you know, nah, man. Time. I'm sick of my shoulders hurting, so I'm yeah. sitting in hardback chairs and shit just to hang out. You're not one of the guys that, that takes the uh, the stool on stage, I've noticed. Oh, I can't sit down, no. My energy level goes down too much when I sit down. Right. And, and I'm also just too antsy. I like I like being jumping from si- side to side of the stage. It really makes, uh, I don't know, it's fun. Yeah, <laughs> no. It's just fun. I don't agreed. like to sit down. Yeah, definitely. So let's just get right into that then. I, you know, as I said, I was at the Late Show yesterday, mm-hmm. and um, as I've, as I've, I've um, observed online, um, you know, your energy is just insane when you're going up to the crowd and you know, you talk to them, you call them crowd, and, you know, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's just very interesting. So how do you keep that energy level when, you know, you're doing two shows Friday, two shows Saturday? How do you keep yourself going? I'm real calm off stage. I, uh, mm-hmm. I also have a lot of Red Bull before <laughs> because uh, I don't know, like... That's what they call cocaine these days? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> nah, man, I couldn't keep a concise thought on cocaine. <laughs> yeah. I don't, my act, man, needs, I, need a, I need a lot of my brain. I can't do any drugs or be drunk with my act because yeah. there's so many little lines, I'll forget it, mm-hmm. and I'll mix it up, and then the show, like, my set can be really beautiful or really just crazy, so I have to yeah. be in control, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I do have a, a drug problem, that you'll see it, because my career will just fall apart. All right, we, we'll uh, be able to tell the difference from Seton to Seton. Yeah, but, right. um, yeah, and it's weird, because I feel bad when I get off stage, people kind of, I feel like when people talk to me after the show, they will expect more of that energy, and I'm like, well, how much do you want? Like, I just gave yeah. you an hour. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Why do I gotta keep jumping around all night for you, motherfucker? Yeah, seriously, <laughs> you wanna come back to my house, too? Like, mm-hmm. honestly. Yeah, no, I don't know, I just, when I first started comedy, I don't know. I just one day I just decided, you know what? It's a lot more fun to be energetic than just sitting around and just ponder my own thoughts. Right. Oh yeah. So talking I don't know about if how it's just who I am. I guess that's the best way. To do. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So did you always have that energy from the get go at your first open mics? Probably. You know, your first time. You ever been on stage yet? Not yet. No. Um. I don't know. I. I. I because you're around comedy, I'm not sure how you'll do, but the first time you're on stage, that's like who you really are for like the first, like that's the most you'll ever be you for like the first three to 12 years. Okay, <laughs> because well. all you go, there's like, all you do when you get first get on stage is like, I just want to be funny. So I think I was energetic at first and then motherfuckers get in your head. They're like, no, you got comedy has to be like this. Comedy has to be like that. Yeah. And then you start trying to follow what they said. And, and so you try a bunch of shit and then eventually go, 
finally you have to let go of those thoughts and just go, I'm going to do me. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's a big thing that you hear comedians talk about, you know, and they'll say that when you first go on stage, you'll be, uh, you know, if your favorite comedian's prior, you'll subconsciously can do some prior sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. just all part of finding your identity. My problem was I had, like, a lot of favorites before I started, so I a lot of my favorite comics were from the 60s and 70s, so... If okay. you were still, if you saw me my first ten years, you would have seen every you've seen a little Pryor, a little Bob Newhart, a little Woody Allen, a little Lenny Bruce, a little Mort Saul. Because uh, <laughs> I'm whatever. Now I can't imagine just from you know uh, being familiar with your work and you know now meeting you and seeing you live. I can't imagine uh, you being anything but an actor and comedian. I just can't see you know there's there's so many comics out there that they're just so perfect for it. Um, what would you see yourself doing if you'd never gotten into it? Um, I don't know. My dad is a professor of political science. My mother's a minister. So maybe I would have done one of those, either gone, because I figure I like doing the stage and speaking thing. I guess I come from mm -hmm. a speaking parent, so. Yeah. It would have been some either kind of teaching or religion. Yeah, if this was like, if we were all slaves right now, I'd probably be trying to get be the black minister good. <laughs> yeah, you'd be the house guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Doing what he's got to do, yeah. Just because you just like to hear myself talk loud. <laughs> right, fair enough. Yeah, the ministry thing and, and the, the religion stuff is very interesting because, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, Sam Kinison was from that background where yeah. he was, you know, a minister. And Do you feel like those things are connected in any sort of way, comedy and religion like that? Um, well, if you look at it as art forms, like the art form of uh, being a preacher, mm -hmm. there's like a word for it. I learned is homiletical or some shit. Okay. Uh, and they, my mother's a minister, so she had me pick up some books on it. And uh, especially black preachers, there's like this consciousness of rhythm mm -hmm. and back and forth that's real direct connection to comedy that just structurally speaking, it's the same way gospel music Im influenced, rhythm, r influenced rhythm and blues, the right. same way preaching kind of influenced stand up. It's a call and response. It kind of, the way preaching kind of starts right at the part or you feel something like, like my life sucks, and you're talking about life sucks, and then mm -hmm. you kind of like guide them out to like God. But great comedians like Pryor would get to life sucks, but then guide you to funny. You know, it's the same kind right. of same techniques, just different outcomes. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, and, and it's true. They say that a lot of comedians, to be a good comedian in certain times, that you need to have a certain level of anger inside of you to project that and make it funny. Do you buy that? It depends what kind of comedian you are. Right. There's so I've many recently kinds. come to the conclusion that every there are just people out there who are really funny, angry, mm -hmm. and I'm not one of them. <laughs> That's okay. all. I, just, yeah. I thought I, it took me a long time to figure that out too. Right. I because uh, I remember I had an acting class once uh, where the woman one of the exercises was uh, talk about something you feel passionate about, mm -hmm. and then talk about something you don't feel passionate about. Okay. And then the example of that acting exercise was to show you like uh, like how how differently you perform when you have passion versus not have passion. Right. And one of the things I chose was I think I, I think I was mad about people who told me how to be really black. I think I just imitated one of those people. They told you how to be really black? Went to an all black school. So okay. there's like a there's different sects of the black community in America that have an idea of how black works. And it's weird because there's different sects that have different ideas. It's real interesting. Okay, like okay. Real hood motherfuckers have an idea, but then real bougie black people have an idea of what black is. It's <laughs> interesting. So, uh, anyways, people like that annoy me. And uh, uh, I think I was imitating them. And I was imitating from a place of anger. And that anger kind of translates to a passion. And so I made my teacher laugh. Right. And so for like seven years after that, I was like, okay, when I'm angry, I'm funny. Mm -hmm. And then just recently, I just figured out, no. That's not it. It's a little deeper than that. So, right. and then I, yeah, so now I'm more positive, more positive guy on stage. It was just a turn, and now that shit, shit's working for me good. That's good. It's a good way to be. I mean, you know, I mean, when people go to see a comedy show, they don't necessarily want to hear about how miserable the world is and, you know, how, how many people do bad. Yeah, exactly. Right? I, mean, for the, I mean, I'm lying. There are people who do it well. Yeah. Like fucking prior talking about lighting himself on fire, he did it very great. Yeah, so right. I was like, I don't hate on that. I think all art forms. I just feel like everybody has, like, some people need to be clean, some people need to be dirty, some people need to talk about family, some people talk about politics. Mm -hmm. I need to be positive, and for some reason, a lot of it turns into dick jokes. I don't know why. It just yeah. is where I'm at right now in my life. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you can't hate on that. Those are always good I, in the I, right I'm, circumstances. I'm having so much fun right now, and yeah. I'm like, I had to look at my life. I'm like, you know what? I could either... <laughs> I could either try to achieve this clean standard and make billions of dollars, or I can be a little bit more happy and a little less rich. I'll yeah. choose that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. What is it about these clean comics that it's kind of like a, 
as you mentioned, sectors. It's like a sector of comedy where there's these these clean guys. And you know, I've even heard stories of people who, um, you know, they're, they're headlining and they tell their their opener and feature that they have to be clean as well because they're clean. Yeah. What's that all about? Is it is it really for the money? I used to think that. Yeah. But uh, and this is this is just me being 33, not 16 anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I just accept, and it's 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 okay for other people just to be offended at shit. You know, it's just okay. Yeah. You know, I just I just like before I used to be like, man, fuck y'all, y'all should be offended. I'm expressing myself. I'm like, no, I mean, you know, you're saying something offensive, so yeah. it's their right to be offended. Why be offended? I mean, and also it's because they're offended. It also makes the joke so funny. So don't yeah. let it go. Some people get offended. So I'm not. I don't know. I just feel like there's a place for everything. And right now, like, I know for me, when I turn my 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 TV on. Clean comedy doesn't really do it for me. I enjoy okay. joke. I enjoy it, and I'm like, and I don't know if I don't want to be an advocate for dirty comedy. I just, mm -hmm. I just want to do my rock clubs, be funny, do yeah. my, do my dirty TV shows and movies, and have my own little world. Like, go yeah. be clean, take over the world. Yeah, Let seriously. me just get this state over here. Yeah, I'll be over be, here. You enjoy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't need you, motherfucker. I'm just gonna yeah. be funny over here. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of like you know you mentioned that you some comedians act surprised that people are offended. It's like slapping somebody in the face and being surprised that it hurts. It's like you know what's gonna happen. Yeah, it's like talking you shit know. in the club and going, "What? Why y'all want to fight?" What? Yeah, <laughs> you, you, yeah. You're, you're, I mean, have some responsibility. Yeah. You just said you hate Asians. What's going on? Yeah, <laughs> well, why are the Asians mad? I'm just talking about them being chinks. I'm like, yes. nigga, come on, be, be respectful. Like, they're human beings in front of you. Why you got to be? So, like, I'm dirty. And, but when people walk out, I've heard people walk out. I'm like, I, 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 I'm not mad at you. I understand. Yeah. Not everybody wants to hear about me uh, coming on things. I get it. Yeah, yeah no, that's understandable. <laughs> I respect especially, you. <laughs> yeah, especially when they say, we just want to go see some comedy. They don't know what to expect. Maybe they're older. Yeah, they want to see, some people want to see Bill Cosby. I'm not going to be Bill Cosby. And it's like, it's so much easier to just accept who you are. As opposed to, and I don't know, there's a lot of there's a lot of money being clean, nigga. Like, mm. there's so much. And I can be clean enough for mm. certain situations. And right. I have. I've done it. It's called selling out. And I am I can do it. <laughs> right. I can easily do it. It's just when I don't have to, I don't. <laughs> like on the South Myers show and such, like where you have to be clean it up a little bit. Yeah, but you know, sometimes, though, artistically, that was actually exciting for me. Because that was something I ain't never discovered before. Like, when I was doing uh, Mulaney, I noticed that. They didn't look at jokes very religiously. Sometimes when you're a comedian, you work on your jokes for long, you start to look at it as like your babies and they're and they're like precious. And 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 once you get on TV, you have to make so many jokes. They stop being precious. You just go right. like, all right, fuck it. We gotta replace that joke with this joke. Fuck it. And once I saw that and I saw motherfuckers making millions of dollars around me, be like being very able to change jokes, I was like, Well, my five minutes here ain't no big deal. So right. you know, I just wrote it out and just changed it. And then it worked out. Like I was like, "Fuck it, I'm funnier than everybody." So fuck it, I can I can do it when I need to. Yeah, I just don't want to. <laughs> That's the attitude you need to have if you're gonna go in a situation like that. You gotta be adaptable, man. Like you, like there's no, like comedy when you. Hey y'all, what's up? I'm sorry, I'm being a professional podcast. That's okay. The door uh, guys have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, comedy is like. Uh, I'm sorry. What was I talking about? We're talking about changing your jokes up to make them cleaner for oh, Seth yeah. Myers and such. Yeah, I just I don't know. It's just fun. I'm yeah. sorry, there was a bigger point, but I lost it. My That's bad. okay. You, well, well, yeah, you, you pretty much what you were saying is that you saw all these guys that can just change it around, and th that the jokes kind of turn into currency. Oh, fuck you know? yeah. yeah. Like, uh, this is the one best example. Like, the two best sets I've ever seen on TV was done by Richard Pryor and Sam Kinison, who are arguably the dirtiest comics. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, But there's this one set of Richard Pryor's, if you listen to Is It Something I Said, he did, like, ten minutes of that CD on... SNL, like this first season of SNL, right. and it was like, per it was so clean, it didn't sound like it ever was dirty. He just changed it up. He perfect. just changed it up so perfectly, and he even said the same thing, and it was like, I was like, oh, okay. People keep saying shit like, oh, he took the, the cursing out. No, he replaced it. That's a okay. difference. Like, the, like when like when people are like, I don't know if you'll ever get to this point, I mean, get to this point, remember this point, mm -hmm. but when you clean your jokes up, you're not, you're not taking shit out, you're replacing, like, like in the sense of like, like, for example, I had a joke where I was just, like I said, did you know Martin Luther King was a whore? He was a whore. I swear to God, he was a whore. So that's like three beats, right? And then the T and NBC very nicely asked, can you not call Martin Luther King a whore? And I was like, absolutely. Fair request. Yeah. Fair request. I ain't got no problem not calling him a whore. Yeah. So then I just made it subtlety, but I kept the rhythm. I was just like, you know Martin Luther King? You know he slept around, right? Did you know that? He slept around? Loved women. Mm -hmm. Said the same thing, nicer. And I was like, enjoy it. I was like, fuck it. So yeah. that's the thing. I replaced it. I didn't try to take it out. That's all I'm trying to say. Right, and and the people in the audience probably thought, "Wow, what a horror!" You know, they they can they can make the connection. Yeah, know? yeah, like there's really, like I don't know, if you write enough, you, really, you it stops being precious and more is just being work. Like your job is, you're sculpting shit. You know, right? 
No, I, I I agree. I can imagine how many writers on Conan and I guess when they were working for Letterman, uh, how how much fire was uh, removed from them, how much passion because you know it just becomes you're just writing jokes at the end of the day. You you've done what you want to do. You're a writer now. You just do your work. You know. Oh, yeah, I don't, yeah. Passion uh, passion doesn't go away like that. No, nah, it's like uh, they still have mad passion. I mean, it's fucking you have that passion to fucking work that hard that they do. Yeah, they fucking work five they days grind, a week, yeah. twelve hours a day. That's mm -hmm. that's nothing but passion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, nah, man. It's, it, uh, no, nah, they're respectable people. I got some of the funniest friends on on this. On the, I got a friend of mine, Michelle Wolf, on Seth Meyers. It's it's kind of awesome to see like friends of yours doing open mics, and all of a sudden they're yeah. doing real professional shit. It's, oh man, it seems like a great gig. I'd be happy for anybody who has it. You know, yeah, it seems wonderful. Nah, and the man. money's always right. You know, it has to be. Money is wonderful. I yeah. ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> I've been a poor artist for too long. I'm done with that shit. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Is there anything when you're going into a situation like that for somebody like NBC? Um, is there anything that you will not compromise for a network and that you will challenge them on? I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Fair I enough. Mean, I mean, for me, it's like you always got to go for what's funniest, not... Mm -hmm. And also, too, also, too, uh, a lot of artists don't understand how replaceable they are. Like, we're not... I, I'm not important to the world. Like, the world is very right. big. I'm expendable. If I die tomorrow, my family will miss me, and that's it. Right. So once you realize you're replaceable, I don't know. It's easier for me to to work with shit. Like I, this is a lesson I had to learn real early. I learned that when I was 23 years old. I was running this comedy show. It was awesome. It was killing. It was filling this bar up every week for a year and a half. And I just thought, all of a sudden, I thought to myself, Shh, bar, you need me. Yeah. I'm the shit. And then one day, I got an attitude with the owner. And he was like, nigga, <laughs> get the fuck out. Take all your shit and grab it through it. I was like, you don't, I don't need you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. No matter yeah. how big you are. Even though that's, that's a very small example, but for me, it was very like, okay, I realized, like, okay, right. I'm going to, I'm not going to sell my, I'm going to try to always work with you and be as funny as possible. That's the whole point. Right. No, that, that, I mean, it's like, for example, if you look at a, a uh, morning show, they're just wanting to interview a comic. Every single comic has their own style, but at the end of the day, if, if one comic cancels, they'll get another. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, people need to realize that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, for example, there's something that, um, you know, I've, I was posting, I'm going to be doing for this podcast where they're sending me out to uh, do a man on the street bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I do realize that they could send another person my age out and it wouldn't make a difference, but, you know, you do, you got to seize the opportunities, you know? Um, they may not. I mean, you, I mean, somebody, people, if you're aggressive and you keep trying to do shit without, people paying you people want those people around yeah it's my lesson in life if you want to do something just start doing it and eventually people will pay you for it <laughs> <laughs> that's good hey i've been doing this for seven years so far and i'm uh, just waiting been for that doing this since you were nine yeah yeah, yeah, you'll eventually get paid, I guess. <laughs> Hope so. What, did you read the article about Judd Apatow doing it? And so you were like, fuck it, let me do that? No, I, I only became aware of, of that whole world only a couple years ago, actually. I just um, I just did it because I really, I just talked too much. It's that simple. <laughs> no, it's awesome, yeah. <laughs> Had to put it on tape. <laughs> what do you mix with? You all white or you mix with black? Mix with black, 50-50, yeah. 50-50. What kind of black? Um... Canadian, I don't know. <laughs> just you never asked what black. kind of black your daddy or mom? I, I mom? think there's roots in Jamaica for my dad, yeah. A lot of Jamaicans up here. I yeah, I think there's roots for sure. All right, cool. That's what it seems like, yeah. And, and you know, it is an interesting thing because that when when writing the bits that I want to talk about, it makes it so much easier because, yeah, that's a wealth of material right there. Have you been on stage yet? No, not yet. What's, what's holding you back? Um, nothing and everything at the same time. I really couldn't tell you. Mm. Um, it's nothing. Yeah, it's I mean, not it's fear. It's fear of nothing, though. Yeah. It's something I really want to do and that I will do. I just... They won't let you on the open mics here? No, they will. They I mean, That's the thing. I have the means. Yourself? Well, don't do it here, then. Do it somewhere else. Do it someplace where people forget you. Don't do it around yeah. your friends. Yeah. <laughs> like, ask, yeah, ask, ask uh, what's that dude's opening... What's his effort? What's it? Matt Aladine? Yeah, Matt Aspen. Or Mike Dambra? Yeah, there's nothing but rooms around here. Just go go yeah. disappear. No. <laughs> yeah. You want to do it? Just go to some room that nobody knows you and... Yeah. Well, I'm in front of strangers for a few years. I didn't invite nobody uh, to my shows. Actually, I made the fucked up mistake of inviting some people I, uh, to a show way too early. Mm -hmm. And after that, I didn't invite nobody to my shows for like seven years. It was yeah. crazy. Like year <laughs> one, I invited them, and I was like, oh, fuck, never again. Seven yeah. years in. So. You're like, give me some time, guys. Give me some, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, even then, when I've shown them, I still feels too early. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's like my grandparents want to show up to my first open mic. I'm like, listen, you're not going to be impressed. Yeah, my parents just saw me probably like 10, 11 years in. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I... I was like, nah, I'm too dirty. Like, I need to start making money first to justify how dirty I am. Right, yeah, <laughs> now they real. can't argue that much. They can complain, but they have no real basis. I'm like, nah, now, sorry, daddy. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of parents, did you, when you were growing up, you grew up in California, correct? I grew up um, in California until I was 12. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to New Jersey from 12 to 18. 
Okay. Yeah. So in New Jersey, did you complete high school? Yeah. You did. Okay. Yeah. So that that removes the element of I'm dropping out of high school to become a comedian. So your parents didn't really have beef with you for no, becoming no, no. A comic? I wanted to not go to college because okay. most of my parents have doctorates and shit. So education is really important to them. So I was like, I just didn't want to go to college and just go straight to comedy. Mm-hmm. And they were like, Please do, please go to college. And I was like, and I was like, all right, fuck it. And so I went to college and. Uh, <laughs> It really was like fuck it. College to me, I, I could give a. I you zoned, just did it, yeah. I literally just zoned the fuck out for four <laughs> years, and like literally I, literally, I keep telling people the happiest day of my life. My life has gotten incrementally better every day since I've left school. Like, okay. like I graduated May seventh. My life was like a hundred times better May eighth. <laughs> <laughs> I just fucking was like, yes, I'm done with you, motherfuckers. What was the first change? The first change of what? Oh, on May eighth, just being out of it. Yeah, it was like, college to me, it was like I was ready to start my life. College was talking about life. When you, Once you get to life, do this. And I was mm-hmm. like, I'm sick of fucking talking about doing it. Yeah, let's just let's fucking do it. do it. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this for four years. I'm fucking waiting. I'm sick of this shit. So I actually started comedy junior year in college. And so I was kind of like really anxious. So like I was trying to balance books and, and bombing on stage. Because you can't, you need the time to think and <laughs> uh, whatever. So. so you started in your first year of college? Comedy? Uh, no, I started my third year. So after my junior year, that scene, that summer before senior year is when I started. So 21. Okay. So is there a good scene for it, uh, for comedy in New Jersey? I was in D.C. I was doing college. I was went to college in D.C. So oh, D.C. I okay. apologize. Uh, left high school, went to college in D.C. And yes, the scene there was dope. It was like, it started off a little shaky, and then eventually I was doing like comedy seven days a week there. It was great. Wow. Yeah. So were you around like uh, Donnell Rawlings and Chappelle and all them, or was it after them? Uh, yeah, I'm not that old at all. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, they had moved way before. I started comedy in 2003. Chappelle's show can't went off by then. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's dead and gone by then. Yeah. yeah, no. So I didn't. I never saw him. I saw him in D.C. a couple times, but that was from like huge performances of uh, stadiums. Donnell Rawlings I opened up for him a couple times. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's old. He's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah he's no, he's nice. a good energy, and his his act is great. He's fun. Yeah, he was one of the first interviews I did at this club, actually, and he was very gracious. Nah, he's an, he's a awesome, awesome, awesome dude. Been funny for years. I saw him once when I was 17. He used to run this random room in Brooklyn, and then mm-hmm. I had a friend of mine, friends with him, and I was the... I mean, at the point, at 17, it was the craziest show I'd ever seen in my life. Now I've seen a little bit more on par, but I remember it was crazy. It was like... Uh, uh, um, there was okay. He was talking shit, talking shit, and then this chick just kept walking by. And this chick had like this most beautiful, gorgeous body, great ass, and she knew it. And she was walking around, <laughs> flaunting it. Mm-hmm. And so like by the third time she's walking by stage, she's like kind of really showing herself off. And to the point that Donald's, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's so nice. And she started flirting with him. Mm, I love it. Keep going, girl. Mm. And then it starts to build. And then, I don't know how it got to this point. We find out that she's a stripper. Oh, well. Um, find out that she's, like, bragging about money and, like, I got a nice new car. And then, like, Donnell was, was like, well, so what, bitch, you still live in the projects? So I was like, ah. This is, like, 1999. So I was like, ah. And then, <laughs> and then, I don't know how this happened, but somebody else, some old man put up $100. He was like, I'll give $100 to the woman with the best pussy in the room. During the show? During the show. Oh, my God. And then the stripper was like, that's me. But then for some weird reason, there was a group of girls behind the stripper was like, fuck that bitch, you ain't got, and then all of a sudden they got having like a loud argument of who <laughs> had the best pussy in the room. And uh, yeah, that was the wildest show I'd seen at that, at that point. I think something happened. I think somebody got cleared out, but Dino kind of calmed it down. Then he got into a fight with the wait staff because oh. they were like, why the fuck are you causing this trouble? He's like, don't tell me how to fuck do my job. It was so <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> that is crazy. Dino was probably like, well, I can tell you who's got the best in the room. Just meet me after the show. But until then, yeah. let's keep it down, you mm. know? Mm. That's the crazy thing. There are so many attractive women that come through comedy clubs. It's crazy. They really not seem enough. Like it. No? Not enough. Nothing compared to music shows. Yeah. When I was in yeah. D.C., me and my best friend used to have this music slash comedy show. He's a musician, and uh, he just did the new Chanel ad with uh, Giselle Bunchkin. Okay. And uh, he, uh, it was amazing. Like I remember like with comedy shows, hot women will come, but they usually, usually 90% of the time come with their husbands, boyfriends yeah. for a good night. Yeah. Music shows, they come in groups of girls, and they come ready to fuck. It's yeah. great. Like they're, <laughs> they're just like, mm, my vagina's ready, sing yeah. to me. And then like I used to just host the show. It was, it was probably one of the better times of my life that time. <laughs> Two years of just being the shit. So just you're really into the rock scene? Not in particular. Like I, I, I just like I like sex. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I like music. I love music and all. I just I don't I don't like actually hanging around musicians like that. They're uh, it's hard to talk to. They're hard to talk to because they th- they think differently. 
Right, and that, that's the the difference. Comedians are so easy to talk to. I mean, it's it's like a breeze. You know, I've only known you for like a half hour, and here we are, mid conversation. Yeah, well, you <laughs> asked me good questions, so I could just spew out. Oh, Musicians, uh, are fucking weird. You know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the, you know, because it's weird. Like with comedians, everything we say that's our value system. You know, like mm-hmm. did you just say something interesting? Did you mm-hmm. say something funny? And other people in the world don't think that way. They have a different value system as far as conversations go. And I yeah. just sometimes don't understand it. I'm like, well, what do we, what do we, what's our, what's our goal here in this, this chit chat, huh? Right. Yeah. Is our goal just to be bored? Cause yeah, <laughs> killing that goal. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's crazy. So, what kind of music are you into when you're like hanging out at the house and stuff? What do you listen to? I like a lot of music. I think too. So I'm listening a lot to Action Bronx and. Okay. Um, I like Drake's last album. That's a, well, yeah, like, it's really good. Yeah, yeah. I like uh. I also like weird shit. There's a Swedish folk singer named Tallest Man on Earth I like. Uh, <laughs> and then there's like, uh, I got a weird mix right now. I like hipster music. I like classical music. I like R&B. I like exploring. Yeah. Yeah, I like, yeah, that's what it is. That's the fun stuff. Anytime I hear a Swedish folk singer, you know it's going to be good. Yeah. It's just obscure and it's weird. It really is. I just, but he's a great storyteller. I like, I like a lot of music that has storytelling in it, like that surprises you too. Like it, like you can like it just to like it, but then there's a story in it. Like LCD Sound System does that. Mm-hmm. Uh, MF Doom does that. I like that shit. It just a Decemberist. I like that shit. Like you listen to like an album from start to finish and it ends and like this arc is fucking. Wow. I don't know. That's awesome. No, it's it's good to have an eclectic taste for sure. No, I just like to realize how art is all connected in that. Our whole point of art is just express right. life, right? And expression of life and making it beautiful. So painters make life beautiful in this way of their experience. And then, like, mm-hmm. I saw today this this dancer who kind of imitated, like, during a song, kind of what it would look like to fast forward. I don't know. It's hard to explain. But, you know, like, when you take the frames out of shit and you start jumping, she yeah. was dancing that way. Wow. And it was just kind of cool. Just, she was just sharing her experience with her body. And I was like, that's what art is. Just like... And I mean, there's, you know, you obviously there's some art that can make more money than others, but <laughs> yeah, seriously, dance is such a weird art form. I mean, I, I have a cousin; she she uh, she's a dance teacher, and it's just her passion, and it's just such a, a an overlooked art form. I find, you know, I feel it's underappreciated by some. Yeah, no, I feel you. No, it's so hard, and it's a beautiful thing to like really cont- be aware of your body to that extent. I mean, athletes yeah. have that too. That's why they, they when you ha, when you know your body, a, dancers and act and and like football players all like walk the same. You ever notice that shit? It's like their chest is out. Yeah. There's like this balance. They look like gazelles. Prim and proper. Yeah. There's not a lot yeah. of like football players and good dancers who walk schlubby. Sh- like yeah. <laughs> their head's yeah. not down. They're not just like Ooh. no. They're yeah. fucking. They just. But it's from awareness. It's awesome. Yeah. No. Definitely. Going back to what we were talking about real quick about mm-hmm. the the clubs and such with the with the ladies. Yeah. Um. Little whore nigga, come on. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Do you ever use the kind of move when you're talking to a chick? Do you use the move like, listen, I'm a comedian? Is that the the automatic you're in? Nigga, I'm 33 years old. I don't fucking (laughs) use tactics anymore. (laughs) When you get to a certain age, it's not tactics anymore. It's it's it's, (laughs) like literally hitting on girls is less of a game of like. It's like it goes from like hungry, hungry hippo to a complicated game of chess. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> like, got to make the right move. Night seven, you know. Yeah, when you're 20, <laughs> young, you just fucking just you just fucking start swinging and just see what some shit happen. But now, nah, man, like now, I kind of you see a thousand steps ahead. Go like, okay, you're gonna do this. I'm gonna do that, and then we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna have sex. <laughs> <laughs> <And that's it. laughs> or like we're gonna do this, 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 that, and you're gonna say no to sex. And no, uh, no, nah, nah, I don't. I don't use comedian. I actually try to avoid it. Let me tell you the fuck happened. Yo, okay, let's, let's multiple it. times in D.C., I remember I was starting to get a name for myself, and I would get, uh, I would be sitting out at a bar with a girl, we'd be drinking, and, like, sometimes somebody from who saw me at a show would come up to me like, hey, man, you funny as fuck. Hell yeah. And, like, you would think, like, women would go like, oh, shit, what do you do? You seem cool. Nah. They I don't literally, care. I turn back and they have this look like, what the, f- who the fuck was, what the hell, who are you? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <ew>. being harassed. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't look at it as sexy as I think it is. <laughs> it's supposed to. Fair enough. So, no. Yeah, when you're in music, it's, it's like the automatic uh, go. Uh, yeah. If you're a smaller band, you know, oh my even. God, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, if I get a certain level of fame, obviously you're going to get that, but. Yeah. Like, I mean, when I was on the TV show, there's a vibe. The Fox, <laughs> the Fox show, right? Yeah. Okay. There's a vibe, but I don't know. Fair I've enough. had, listen, let's not act like I'm, I've had a lot of sex after show. I shouldn't, <laughs> my mom might listen to this. I apologize, mom. 
there, there, there is like a narcissism to it, like having mm-hmm. sex after a show. Obviously, I've done that. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I remember I tell people, like, to be honest, like literally when I was in my 20s, like the sexiest thing after a show was like if a girl told me, I saw you on stage and I had to fuck you. You're like, well, Done. thank you. No, because yeah. it's like I have nothing else in my life except for stage. So you like that? That's me. Yeah. Some people are like I want people to like me for me. I mean, we see me on stage. There's nothing else more. I mean, there's a quiet side of me, but that's me. That's that's my me. That's not your me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. You're 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 showing your personality on stage. You're sharing yourself. That's all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. So. Seton Smith, I'd, I'd like to thank you for doing this show. Uh, it was cool, a pleasure. Uh, your website, SetonSmith.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else you wanted to plug? Oh yeah, I'm gonna have an album coming out July 16th. Cool. Um, I don't have a name for it yet. I'm going with LA Sex Party. What you think of that? That sounds good. LA that sounds Se- fun. Because usually the comedians will go with the move of having a slightly ironic title with a little bit of a joke. If you just called it something cool, I think that'd be refreshing. Yeah, I like LA Sex Party. For some reason, it just sounds so. Yeah, it seems fun. Seems like. Yeah. You won't be surprised by my act if you yeah. know the TD titles called. <laughs> nobody's LA sex. being offended with this record. Yeah, nobody's no not not many like self old women are gonna be like, "I like a sex party." That's for me. No, yeah. you're gonna go. All right, <laughs> this dude's probably gonna be a little wild. Good. All right, maybe I'll stick to that. Thanks for that. And that comes out next month. Uh, no, I'm shooting it in July 16th, so hopefully it'll, it'll come out August. I don't know. I've never really done these things before. I'm hoping it's awesome. only a month. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Hey, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. No problem, it. yo. Thank you very much. Seton Smith on the Cassius Morris show. That was really cool, actually, digging that up out of the vault. There's a couple other ones I can't wait to release. I'm going to space them out. There's going to be some brand new content, of course, coming out. But I guess to everybody listening, this is brand new content. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. I want to remind you about one of our sponsors before we close out this episode. The Cassius Morris show is sponsored by BlackoutX.com, a high-end brand of nicotine and non-nicotine legal herb and legal concentrate vaporizers if you smoke anything it might be a good idea to take a look at some vaporizing products to at least take down the intake of conventional smoke coming into your lungs so check out blackoutx.com for their high-end varieties of vaporizers and of course you can use the promo code 420cmx at checkout that's 420cmx at checkout to save 15% off all items and all orders courtesy of yours truly. So, it's a pretty good offer. BlackoutX.com, 420CMX. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Cassius Morris. I'm on Instagram, at Cassius Morris underscore. The, tw- the show is on Twitter, at Cassius Show, and on Facebook, at Facebook.com slash Cassius Show. The website's going to be up soon. But, of course, you can stay up to date with the Cassius Morris Show on all podcast streaming services, including Stitcher Radio and Apple Podcasts. New episode every Wednesday, as well as YouTube.com slash Cassius Morris. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel over there. We're trying to hit 1,000 subscribers so we can become an official YouTube partner and start getting paid for the content we're putting up there on YouTube. So if you subscribe, uh, you're helping us out, not only then, but continually in the future Uh, by being updated on our content. And of course, if you have the chance to give a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher Radio, it would be a huge help as well. So, until next time, this is Cassius Morris saying, Rock on.